Thank you. Welcome to the Magnus. I'm Ben Brinner, the acting faculty director of the Magnus as of one month ago. Um, so I'm new on this job, but I'm not new at the Magnus. Uh, I've been the faculty director of Jewish studies for four and a half years and have worked closely, particularly with my predecessor here, George Breslauer, who was the first faculty director of the Magnus. And as some of you may know, I have a long-standing family connection to this institution. We are truly excited to have you here tonight for this very special occasion. After three years of concentrated effort by our curatorial staff, we are now showcasing these distinctive works of art of Arthur Schick from our Toby family Arthur Schick collection. Thank you, Tad and Sean Toby, and Shana Penn, and uh, of, of the Family's Foundation. And welcome back to the Magnus, Danielle Moss, Arthur Schick's great-granddaughter, who joins us from New York. We also have a first exhibition drawn from Roman Vishniak's photographic work, recently gifted to the Magnus by his late daughter, Mara Vishniak, Mara Vishniak Cohen. We are very pleased that her son, Professor Benjamin Schiff, who I just got to meet, uh, is here with us this evening. Entering the Schick Gallery, you may have noticed the first right opposite you is a photograph that Vishniak took of Schick. It's a nice expression of the connection between the two men whose, whose work is on exhibit here. These magnificent gifts are extraordinarily generous and transformative. We're so proud to celebrate them together and to celebrate together the new world of opportunity that they open up at UC Berkeley and to the community at large. Um, and for, for the Magnus in particular, many of you support the Magnus and have supported the Magnus maybe as far back as the 1960s when it was on Russell Street. This evening you've shown your support once again and we have a pretty much a capacity audience. In fact, we had to turn people away and due to that uh, we are going to have another opening on March 12th, a uh, not by invitation public opening. So please come back, tell your friends and your family. Chancellor Carol Christ is in Sacramento today. There are things more important than the Magnus, very few, but the legislature is one of them. And so she's unable to be with us, and I'm going to read a message from her. She says, welcome to a Berkeley jewel, the Magnus collection of Jewish art and life. Tonight you will celebrate the great artist Arthur Schick and his dedication to his unique craft. With my personal thanks to Toby Philanthropies for their trust in the Magnus to be the home for the Schick Collection, as well as for their generosity in hosting all of you tonight, I celebrate with you from afar. So, for all the generous support that the Magnus is receiving from Chancellor Christ and the campus, including Dean Cascardi, Tony, are you still here? Yes, Dean Cascardi, Dean of Arts and Humanities, our, our big boss, um, and our very supportive big boss. Um, so for all the wonderful support we're getting from the Chancellor and our Dean, we simply could not survive, let alone thrive, without the support of private individuals and foundations. And I hope that you will consider continuing to support us into the future. And now it is my pleasure to introduce the Bay Area leader to whom we owe the splendid edition of Arthur Schick's work to the holdings of the Magnus Collection of Jewish Art and Life, the man who made this possible, Tad Toby. Immigrant... Yeah. I imagine that's the first of several rounds of applause. Immigrating as a child from his native Poland on the eve of World War II, Mr. Toby went on to earn two degrees at Stanford, in addition to serving in the US Air Force. He has had a long career in real estate and has been awarded many honors and positions on the boards of foundations and universities. Mr. Toby's generosity supports philanthropic enterprises too numerous to enumerate here ranging across many projects that are crucial to Jewish peoplehood, culture, and education, both here in the Bay Area and as far away as Poland and Israel. Indeed, Mr. Toby is responsible, together with the Corette Foundation and the late Warren Hellman and others, for the fact that we are gathered here in this location, the result of the merger between the old Magnus Museum and the University of California, which they led to fruition 10 years ago. We've been here 10 years now. Please join, join me in welcoming and thanking Mr. Toby. And <clears throat> Excuse me. 
Well, I certainly appreciate that uh, wonderful introduction. Uh, and, uh, uh, you know, as I, as I listened to the introduction, I thought about this organization and, and its history. It occurred to me, can you hear me? Not well? How about now? Okay. The history here is rather serendipitous, as is so many things that happen in my life. Uh, I, I want to go back about 10 years when uh, Irv Rabin, who was uh, involved uh, with the Magnus on Russell Street, uh, came to me and to Jeff Harbour in his capacity at the Corette Foundation, uh, and to Warren Hellman, uh, seeking funding for uh, Magnus. And uh, we uh, customarily ask for financial statements when people want funding from us. And uh, I have to tell you, the financial statements of the Magnus uh, were not pretty. Uh, in fact, uh, Warren Hellman and Jeff and I decided that, uh, that it was just would be imprudent to, to give money to what was then the Magnus uh, organization. They just didn't, they didn't have a balance sheet that, uh, you know, that uh, mandated the kind of money that, uh, that the organization was looking for. So the question then is, well, okay, so what happens next? Uh, I was familiar at that point with the history of the Shoah at the University of Southern California which, as you know, was the result of a gift from noted uh, film, or film, or film producer. Uh, and, uh, and, and, and you can hear me all right? I'm sorry. We're going to actually maybe close this, because you're, you're running Barbara Kirschenblatt's slideshow in the back. Oh. So we're going to do this. There you go. Well, thank you, Barbara. <laughs> thank you, Barbara. Well, you get two for one. You get me and you get Barbara. So anyway, uh, the famous movie producer gave the collection to the University of Southern California. Uh, obviously, there may have been some tax ramifications involved. And, uh, and Shoah uh, became part of USC. So I, I asked uh, Warren if maybe that approach might not work with uh, the University of California and Magnus. And Warren was a, a very close member of the University of California Berkeley family. Uh, and uh, he started to explore the situation with UC Berkeley. And uh, Berkeley decided that, that Magnus might be a wonderful acquisition for uh, the uh, Bancroft Museum. And so we merged uh, the, uh, I, I shouldn't say we merged, we caused the merger to occur between what was then the Magnus and, Bank and Bancroft Library at the University of California. Uh, there's one minor catch. Uh, we were working with uh, the, the head of development. Uh, you gotta help me on that one. Uh, Scott, Shay Biddy. Scott Biddy, thank you. And Scott was very accommodative of the transaction, but he said, look, uh, you know, uh, <laughs> the Magnus has been losing a lot of money and we don't have the money to support it. So they came up with the idea that maybe Warren Hellman and the Toby Philanthropies and the Corret Foundation could come up with a plan of maybe subsidizing uh, the Bancroft Magnus for, say, five years, which we did, and, uh, and the rest is history. Uh, Magnus uh, prospered under its new wing with the University of California. It, uh, it got uh, incredible support, uh, not only here at, uh, at the university, but globally. And uh, what you're seeing here now is uh, really the, the result of many years of blood, sweat, and tears, if I can borrow a phrase from Winston Churchill. Um, I, want to, uh, I want to acknowledge uh, this evening that uh, we have, uh, we are honored to have uh, Arthur Schick's grand, great granddaughter, uh, Danielle, with us this evening. And Danielle, could you kind of stand and let everybody take a look at you? And 
Alexandra Schick Bratzi uh, has a recollection of playing with me. Now, I was eight years old at the time, so you know it wasn't in the current circumstances. Uh, and, uh, and it also happens that Danielle's uh, grandfather, uh, Yuzek Bratzyovsky, was a close friend of my father's, as was Arthur Schick. So it's an amazing world we live in. Uh, uh, everything kind of, uh, what is the movie version that was referred to as uh, coming around? Uh, anyway. <laughs> From, what was the f famous movie? The Six Degrees of Separation. Thank you very much. You have to forgive me. I'm uh, uh, 89 years old, and so I, I don't remember things as well as I used to. Uh, through his prolific pen, paintbrushes and pens, Arthur Schick showed his strong commitment to democracy, freedom, and justice to Poland, America, Israel, and beyond. His art portrays his Jewish uh, heart and his Jewish commitment. I'd like to take a moment to recognize several other friends of the Magnus and of our philanthropy that are with us this evening. Uh, I didn't see Anita Friedman and Jeff. Did you? Are you here? We'll be late. Thank you. So anyway, I would recognize them in absentia as being very major supporters of the Magnus. Uh, we have uh, Barry Cohn, who is the chairman of the foundation board that supports the, the Magnus. Sandy Colon, who I haven't seen either. Is Sandy, are you here? In absentia. Lisa Tabak, who I know is here because I saw her a little while ago. Would you stand, please? OK. Anyway, we have major donors and a for, former board member, Fran, Francis Dinkelspiel, who was instrumental in hurting the board to do the deal with the Bancroft, which uh, I, might, I might tell you was uh, not a walk in the park. The board was very concerned about the continuity of the Jewish heart of the Magnus. Uh, we have Stephanie Rapp of the Hass Fund. Stephanie? There you are. OK, thank you. Uh, I'd like to recognize uh, one of my attorneys, Lawrence Siskin, who I know is here. L Larry, would you stand? And, uh, and my longtime friend and benefactor of this wonderful collection, Irvin Unger, who recognized the, recognized the value of the Schick art, collected it for years, and uh, made this transaction of of buying the collection for the University of California uh, reality. I'm also proud to introduce my son, Sean. Sean, this good looking young man up here, <laughs> looks just like me, uh, a director of, of our foundation, active Jewish community member, and Rick Mayerson, who's the senior vice president of our foundation. And then there is the one and only uh, foundation extraordinaire, director Shana Penn, who supervises all of our philanthropic operations in the United States, in Israel, and Poland, and makes sure that it all comes together. So Shana, thank you for what you do. You got a bigger hand than I did. We regret that the Chancellor of the University of California couldn't join us this evening. However, we are very pleased that the Dean of Arts and Humanities, Tony Cascardi, is with us this evening. And this, Tony, there he is. That, <laughs> and the, and the, uh, and, and the, and Ben Brenner, who is the Center of Jewish Studies director, Ben, who helps ensure that the campus under, understand. 
I'm having a very tough time. Is this thing on a spring or? <laughs> Many of you do not know that the Magnus is the first Jewish museum to be founded in the United States after the Holocaust and holds the third largest Judaica collection in the United States. Now that we have helped to secure its position at Berkeley, we are proud of the great advances that have already been made, and we are excited to envision the future opportunities. I think most of you at this point have seen the exhibit that was put together by uh, the great Francesco Spagnola, who really deserves a huge hand. Francesco helped to bring the Magnus Collection to Berkeley, and, uh, and Francesco is responsible for stewarding the valuable collections that have been added to the Magnus over the last 10 years, such as the Schick, which we are exhibiting this evening, and the Vishnak Photography Collection, which is one of the greatest photography collections on the planet. Can relax, it's almost over. You know what? I struggled because I didn't put on my glasses. And uh, the question is whether I have them or not. You have them? That shows you how close we are. She knows my glasses prescription. I think we need a photographer. What do you think? <laughs> One of the first major grants to the Magnus at its former home in Berkeley was to support the Meyer July exhibition and its companion book, a project curated by the remarkable Barbara Kirschenblatt Gimblatt with her talented father, artist, the late Meyer Gershenblatt. Being with them at that ex exhibit opening remains one of my cherished memories. Our foundation is delighted to continue the re our partnership with Barbara here at the Magnus, as well as at the world-famous Poland Museum in Warsaw. Uh, thank you for the courtesy that you've extended to me this evening, and uh, uh, enjoy the rest of the evening. I guess I'm the guy who stands behind, be, between this amazing talk and uh, our keynote speaker. My name is Francesco Spagnola. I'm the curator of the Magnus Collection of Jewish Art and Life. And it's an honor to stand here to discuss our new exhibition in real times and to introduce our distinguished speaker, Professor Barbara Kirschenberg Gimblet. The exhibition we're presenting today marks the culmination of a process that began several years ago with plans to acquire the Toby Family Authorship Collection in conversation with Toby Philanthropies, with Tad Toby, and with Shana Penn. The collection was acquired in the spring of 2017 from collector Irving Unger, who is here with us this evening. Hi, Irv. Since then, together with an incredible team of colleagues and students who have been working very hard to transform what had been a private collection into a public one, we have secured the physical stability of over 450 original works of art, and countless books and archival documents. We have confirmed titles, dates, and locations by thoroughly researching Arthur Schick's exhibition history and created thousands of digital files. Most importantly, we have strived to make the collection accessible to all, beginning with our devoted colleagues and students on this campus. A public collection is not only physically accessible to everyone, it's also open to a virtually endless array of research interests and interpretations. With the exhibition we're presenting today, the Magnus is also taking a stab at offering our own interpretive path. The real times of Arthur Schick's life and work, namely the progressive unraveling of European democracy and the painstaking restoration of human rights in the first half of the 20th century, continue to be very real today. 
authorship concerns were in line with many of his peers, East European Jews who, were dip, who deeply understood the nexus between minority rights and global human rights in the wake of the First World War and during and after the Holocaust. While unique in his aesthetic outlook, Schick had many companions in his journey, even though he did not know all of them personally. This exhibition highlights a few. Among them, historian Emanuel Ringenblum, political thinker Hannah Arendt, and filmmaker Charlie Chaplin. He also had followers, ranging from cartoonist Art Spiegelman to filmmaker Taika Waititi, whose depiction of Adolf Hitler in the recent movie, Jojo Rabbit, seems drawn directly from Schick's own paintbrush. The exhibition also strives to represent the singular clash between the miniature size of most of Schick's artwork and the magnitude of the themes it confronted. To do so with an important input from our colleague, Professor Greg Niemeyer, who I think is in the audience, he's back there, chair of the Department of Art Practice, we research the artwork through a digital lens. Magnification enables us to reconstruct the artist's own gaze. Our ability to digitally crop and remix elements of Schick's multi-layered art brought us, and especially our students, extremely close to his techniques and perhaps also to his mind. Visitors to the exhibition are invited to take part in this endeavor and to play, but also to think with us. My special thanks go to two undergraduate students, Tamara Berkover and Catherine Yang. Catherine is here. I see her in that corner. Please stand up. She deserves a clap. Along with my fabulous colleagues, Dr. Shirko Javi, who had the good idea of going on maternity leave as we were about to launch the exhibition. Shir, stand up on top of the bench. Assistant curator, Julie Franklin, who I'm sure is back there. Uh, the Registrar of the Magnus Collection, and Ernest Jolly, the Preparator. I see him back there. Thank you, Ernest. As the exhibition is being presented and, a, and as press coverage begins to come in, we're now sta starting to appreciate the road ahead. We will continue to finalize the catalog and study the behavior of the visitors. That's, that's actually you, right, in the audience. So we can continue to learn and develop new ideas. And we plan to let the exhibition fly off with national and hopefully international loans. Indeed, we expect this exhibition to travel far away from Berkeley. There is already interest from the National World War II Museum in New Orleans and more, including Israel and Poland. We will learn more about this and a lot more from a distinguished keynote speaker, a teacher, colleague, and a friend to many of us, Professor Barbara kirschenbach gimblet Barbara kirschenbach gimblet is university professor. I mean, this, this is good. This is the good part. <laughs> is University Professor Emerita and Professor Emerita of Performance Studies at New York University, and the Ronald S. Loader Chief Curator and the, of the core exhibition of Poland Museum of the History of Polish Jews in Warsaw. I said it only in one breath. Her books include Destination Culture, Image Before My Eyes, They Call Me Marriage Light, that she compiled, created with her father, and that was presented at the Magnus and the Tad acknowledged earlier, The Art of Being Jewish in Modern Times, and Anne Frank Unbound. And we are actually reading her work in my seminar these, these weeks. So she's very much with us, even when she's not with us in person. She was honored to, for lifetime achievement by the Foundation for Jewish Culture, received the Mlotek Prize for Yiddish and Yiddish Culture, honorary doctors from the Jewish Theological Seminary of America, the University of Haifa, and Indiana University, and the 2015 Marsh, Marshall Sclair Award for her contribution to the Social Scientific Study of Jewry. She was decorated with the Officer's Cross of the Order of Merit of the Republic of Poland for her contribution to the Poland Museum. She was recently elected to the American Academy of Arts and Sciences and awarded the 2020 Dan David Prize. Please join me in welcoming the wonderful Barbara Kirschenba Glimblet and hopefully her PowerPoint. We're going to try and restore it as we come to the stage. So let's see. I'm going to try and help with this and make it, make it happen again. Yeah, let, 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 let me do so this first. Need... Wait, wait till, you, till, till I do let's this. Let's see if I get it. It's a special Magnus dance that gets his PowerPoint to start. And uh, yeah, no, the, the, it's, it's coming on. It's coming on. We just need to hit play. I'm sorry, this was the best I could do already. Okay, where is the slideshow? The slideshow is here. Or here. And I want presenter mode. Okay, click it again. Oh, can I do it? Presenter and mode. And presenter mode here. Yeah. And then I need to take it to the very beginning. Yeah, I know. All right, so give me just a second. Oh my okay. God! No. Go back. Oh, it's like this yeah. is crazy. This is 
going to be, we're giving everything away. Here okay, we go. Okay, there we go. Okay. Thank, thank you, you, Barbara. <clears throat> well, I'm delighted to be here, and I thank you very, very much uh, for this opportunity. I especially want to congratulate Francesco for putting on what is really a marvelous exhibition and quite innovative in its approach, but also in the digital components, which I hope you'll take an opportunity to see. But my very warmest congratulations and appreciation go to Ted Toby and Ted's family for the gift not, uh, of the Schick Collection to this museum. It's a really wonderful collection, and I'm grateful to Ted not only for his support of the Magnus Museum, but also for his support of Pauline Museum of the History of Polish Jews, where he's really been a stalwart supporter and a very a wonderful voice in support of the museum, even in difficult times. And so, and our uh, and his support, uh, really, as he mentioned, actually goes back, um, I would say, more than more than ten years to the exhibition of my father's paintings at the Magnus when it was in its older building. Uh, and he has since made it possible for Pauline Museum to acquire the Kirschenblatt uh, fam family's collection of my father's paintings. So for all of that, I am enormously, enormously grateful, and I thank you, Ted, from the bottom of my heart. It really means the world to me. So in real times, here's what I'd like to do. The Magnus is part of a university. The, this museum is, is, is a university museum. There's a huge opportunity here for the university to take full advantage of this museum. And I know that Francesco has been working intensively with undergraduates, with students, in the creating of this exhibition, but in the use of the Magnus more generally. And I would like to think that this is um, really a moment, this particular exhibition is really a moment to see the ways in which this museum and its exhibitions and its collections can, uh, can realize its potential for the university. And so that is really my, my mission in my comments this evening, is to do just that. Now, the, 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 the museum, the Magnus Museum, is actually under the umbrella of the Center for Jewish Studies. And the mission of the Center for Jewish Studies is to gather faculty, students, and visiting academics for research and debate across wide, the wide scholarly landscape of Jewish studies. And, and the Magnus itself is an example the center builds upon Berkeley's long tradition and exemplary reputation in the field, and it looks forward to collaboration with other institutions in the Bay Area and beyond. Now, the, the beauty of Jewish studies as a field, and the beauty of Jewish studies as a field here at the University of California, Berkeley, and I am proud to say I am an alum, I have my AB and my MA from the University of California, Berkeley, and, <laughs> and, I was here in the fateful years of 1965 to 67. Yeah. So, I would say I have credentials. <laughs> so, the Center for Jewish Studies is interdisciplinary and uh, I, I take this as really one of its great strengths. What are some of the fields represented by the faculty and represented by the courses? Comparative literature, Near Eastern studies, history, sociology, law, political science, journalism, rhetoric, and music. There is not one of those fields that is, that, that is every single one of those fields would find something of value, something of interest in this exhibition and in this collection. And one of the things I'd like to do is to su suggest the kinds of questions one could bring to this kind of material, questions that are specific and questions that are much, much more general. And so if I were to uh, try to state in a nutshell what such an exhibition could yield to any of those fields and more, it would be the developing of what I would call 21st century competencies. And what are they? They are, first of all, critical thinking because this is an exhibition which to unpack it to understand it and to think about the work of Arthur Schick, and not only the exhibition. One, one of the things that I think is a real strength is in one of those digital um, uh, tablets, you have the entire collection. All 450 works are there, and you can explore them. You can bring them up, you can magnify them, and you can really work with the whole collection, and not only with what's in the exhibition. 
So first of all, critical thinking. Second, media literacy. Was there ever a time in our lives when it was more important uh, to have what we call media literacy, the ability to understand what you are seeing, hearing, and reading, whether it's in the press, on TV, whether it's on social media, media literacy. And the third is emotional intelligence. And one of the things that struck me about Arthur Schick's work, and it's work that I'm familiar with, but I had not really thought about it until I had the opportunity to see so much of the original work in this exhibition, is how emotional it is. It is a kind of lexicon of feeling, and when you're, and I hope that you will take advantage of the time that we have this evening to go back into the exhibition and to see the, way, the ways in which Arthur Schick gives visual expression to emotion and to some very, very dark feelings of, uh, I would say, feelings of uh, despair, but also empathy, of disgust, of uh, just a whole range of affect, and is given very strong visual, exp uh, visual expression. So developing 21st century competencies, critical thinking, media literacy, and emotional intelligence, for starters. To say nothing, of course, of the creative impulse, how to work creatively uh, in response to all kinds of events, and in particular with Arthur Schick, and I think this is one of the great strengths of the exhibition, is as Francesco explained to me when we were viewing the exhibition yesterday, is that it doesn't follow the usual pattern of looking at Arthur Schick's identity. That is the life and work of Arthur Schick as an artist, as a Jew, as a Pole, as, a, as an American, and even, I think, a year or two in Canada. I'm a Canadian, so that was very meaningful for me. But instead of Instead of doing a kind of more art historical or more historical approach to Arthur Schick and his work, what Francesco has done, which I think is really uh, to his credit, and it's also a way of revealing something very fundamental that's actually a through line in Arthur Schick's work, and that is to look at him as someone who used art in the service of human rights. And one of the extraordinary things, and I don't think I fully realized it, because when I thought of Arthur Schick, I was thinking of the Haggadah, which of course is probably his best known work. And I have the feeling that we had some free Haggadahs at our Passover seders that had really poorly reproduced cheap uh, uh, images from his work, and that's all we ever knew. And that seemed to me to really do him an injustice. And I never realized that the Haggadah it, there's, I can't think, there's hardly a work, maybe the portrait of his wife, there's hardly a work where his concern with uh, protest, politics, human rights, uh, uh, struggle for freedom, independence, where those kinds of issues aren't present in some way, in one way or another. And so um, it seems to me that he, he is more than simply an artist whose work we can present, whose life we can present, but that taking this line, this through line, of a struggle for a more just society um, is a very, very productive one. And the beauty of the way the exhibition is organized is that the sections of it, in fact, resonate with the issues of our time. Issues of um, totalitarianism, refugees, migration, uh, all, all kinds of issues that are very relevant today are, in fact, issues that he took up. Now, when, I, when I'm thinking about this material, and I'm thinking about it from the perspective of, say, teaching, uh, what are the questions I would bring to this material, and what are the questions I would encourage my students to be thinking about or asking? So the, the first ones that I, would, that I would start with would be ones that really come from my work um, at Pauline Museum of the History of Polish Jews. And they're questions that I, I, that I would put to any of these key figures. And the first question is, is how does the history of Polish Jews illuminate the life and work of Arthur Schick? And the second would be, how does the life and work, or how do the life and work of Arthur Schick illuminate the history of Polish Jews? Now, history is one of the fields that's represented in Jewish studies. Those are two wonderful questions, and particularly if the course is dealing with the history of Polish Jews, then Arthur Schick would be an absolutely classic case. Born in Lodz in 1894, living between Lodz and Paris, and then shortly in Canada, and then in the United States. He, he, his career, his life, and, 
and particularly because he lived through the major events of the 20th century. He lived through World War I, he, 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 he lived through, he fought in the Polish army, he, he lived through World War II and the Holocaust, of course, not in Europe. He lived in the United States. He, he actually experienced um, the major events of the 20th century and he engaged those events and he is a voice of protest. And the, the issue of protest in our own time and the issue of dealing with totalitarianism and genocide in our own time are very, very relevant. And to see them through the lens of someone who lived through those events in the 20th century and who uh, expressed his positions visually, I think is really very, very, very exciting. And so just a couple of words on <clears throat> pardon me, the ways in which I think that, um, that this material can, can really uh, provide a wonderful opportunity for, uh, for teaching. So, so first of all, let's say politics. Here we have a, a kind of visual midrash, I would say, and that is he, um, uh, one of the things that, that Chick does is he reads world events and he intervenes in them, <clears throat> and his activism has to do with the power of images. So it seems to me that as political commentary, <coughs> excuse me, as political commentary, he would be absolutely perfect material, and especially because he is dealing with and attempting to help his viewers understand the nature and power of propaganda. Now, of course, he creates his own propaganda, but in the, ser in the service of a good cause. And so it seems to me that, that from the point of view of uh, if you will, political science, under, try to understand how it actually works in terms of on the ground, I think he would be a, a wonderful subject. Thank you. Then, of course, liter um, literature. One of the beauties of, 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 of coming to this material from the point of view of literature is to bring the tools of literature to understand these, what I would say, basically visual metaphor, the use of metaphor, allegory, narrative, and visual storytelling. And people who do literary analysis have the tools for exploring this. Now, many of Schick's works, in fact, are works that are based on texts, Declaration of Independence, Statute of Kalish, the Haggadah. So the idea of bringing a literary lens to this material and bringing the tools of literary analysis, I think, could be very, very productive. But I would say, and of course, religious studies, especially the religious texts that he uses, uh, the Haggadah in particular, and the idea of visual midrash, visual commentary, I think would be very, very interesting. But above all, what I find where it's most, most productive would be from the point of view of, it would be from the point of view of media studies, uh, visual culture studies, and uh, of, I would say, um, <clears throat> semiotics, for, in for instance. So what, what does it have to offer? Well, basically, although Schick worked always on a small scale, and a miniature, of course, is his calling card, he also did, as we know, caricature. So he sits not only within the history of art, and not only did he himself recycle art, he, he recycled conventions of Renaissance portraiture, he recycled P Persian miniatures, he recycled Northern European manuscript illumination, but he also is within the history of comic art, within the history of caricature, within the history of political cartoons. So he's actually working in at least two, if not three major, major streams. Now, when I think about him, I think to myself, he's Instagram avant la lettre. You know, because he went viral. Basically, those political cartoons during World War II, they went viral, especially the ones that were dealing with the American military. Millions of people saw them, and they were very, 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 very popular. When I try to think, what, what, what analogies can I find, particularly for the grotesque way in which he would represent the enemy, the evil, Mad Magazine. Uh, there, there is, uh, there, when I think of, you know, um, uh, what me worry, that what me worry guy, there are ways in which some of these really grotesque figures in his, in his material re reminded me of, of, of Mad Magazine. Norman Rockwell, of all people, because there is a way in which uh, Sh uh, Schick is both you, uh, a kind of 
celebrating what I'd call a utopia of freedom, peace, inde independence, and a dystopia of totalitarianism. And Walkwell is not just the happy faces and pictures on Collier's Magazine, where Schick's work also appeared, but also Rockwell also uh, did images that had to do with um, uh, racism, race relations, the situation of African Americans. So there's a way in which the ubiquity and the popularity of his imagery um, and the way in which it spoke to the American public especially uh, reminded me of Norman Rockwell. Then there is, and you can see in this image, if you look, I think, in the bottom right corner, he's a kind of a where's Waldo? Because you'll find him, that, that you, he, he manages to insert himself. It's a bit like those cathedrals where the carvers actually carve themselves into the cathedral. And, and he does that too. You'll find, you have to look carefully, but you will find him drawing, you'll find, you'll find him just tucked in to various places. But here I think you can see him in the bottom right corner. Then I would say, I think of Susan Sontag, fascinating fascism. The power of evil to unleash imagination because there is something about the emotional charge of evil that good doesn't have. And, and that emotional charge is given uh, a kind of grotesque expression that gives enormous power to his work, not only the political, political cartoons, but also some of the other work. But there is also, and uh, I, I think you'll see, I'll, I'll show you an example in just a moment, there also what I would call almost homoeroticism of Tom of Finland. If you know the to Tom of Finland, this Finnish artist who was known for his stylized, highly masculine, masculinized homoerotic art, perfect for gender studies. I didn't see that on the list for Jewish studies, but I'm sure it's there. And, and, and you'll see it in the way in which the American soldiers are represented. And it's not as extreme, of course, as Tom of Finland, but there is that kind of, a certain kind of hyper-masculinity um, that really reminded me of, of, that, of that material. So these are sort of among the, uh, I would say, these are among, among, the, among the ways in which I think um, th this work can be looked at from a media studies, visual culture, cultural studies perspective. Because, and especially, what I want to say is, at Pulley Museum, when we worked with our historians on the core exhibition, one of the takeaways that our historians told us they got from working with us was they learned how to work with visual material. That they had always worked in archives, they'd always worked with texts, but that having worked on the exhibition, they actually learned that visual material is also, if you will, a kind of archive of images, an archive of things, and that it can be enormously useful to the historian or to the literary scholar or to people in other fields if you know how to work with the material. And that would be something that would be something that would be really, really wonderful, wonderful to do. So what I'd like to do now is, is just to simply take you through a couple of images that are in the exhibition uh, and also in the collection and to just comment on them as a way of suggesting how one might use them in teaching or in research. Now, one of the, one of the, one of the most, um, uh, most meaningful for me personally is the Statute of Kalish. And the Statute of Kalish is a, 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 well, basically it's the first time in the history of Poland that the charter for Jews was actually written down. It's 1264. And this statute is really a short document. It's, you know, I don't think it's really longer than, well, they didn't have pages then, but the equivalent of a page. Now, how you could create 47 leaves from one page and do it in miniature, this is Artur Schick. And this is a, a, a marvelous, marvelous document. So what he did is one of the ways you get the 47 leaves, because it's a folio and the leaves are loose and it's not even clear in what order they should go other than the title page, for example, but we, we more or less know. It's in nine languages. And those languages include not only Polish and English, but to my delight, also Yiddish, which is absolutely extraordinary. And of course, and, and you'll notice that the iconography is, is actually specific to the language. And so here, and this is so Arthur Schick, and so here is the English version, 
And then you'll see the iconography at the very bottom. You've got you know, King George slaying the dragon, but then you have two images. And what are the images? On the left is Kashimir Pulowski, a Polish nobleman, the, the, the caption, he writes it, a Polish nobleman who gave his life for the independence of the United States. So the next time you cross the Pulowski Bridge or the Kosciuszko Bridge, you should remember Artur Schick and the Statute of Kalish. And on the right is Chaim Solomon, a Poli this is his language, a Polish Jew who sacrificed his fortune for the cause of American liberty, actually subsidizing the American army. And so what you get is something very characteristic of Schick, and that is to say, he takes an historic text, in this case, 1264, the Statute of Kalish, the founding document for Jewish settlement, their rights, their obligations, their protections in Poland, and he layers onto it connections to later historical events, all of which express his commitment to coexistence, liberty, independence, national self-determination, uh, those are among the values. And the way in which he does it is so rich and requires incredible, I would say, that that's why I think semiotics is perfect for this, and that is that there's a kind of a code and you have to be able to decode it. And the beauty of the digital um, devices in the exhibition is that they encourage the visitor to pay close attention to an object that would otherwise be so small, so detailed, so dense, so fastidious, and so obsessive that without a magnifying glass or a microscope, you wouldn't be able to deal with it. And so, and, and I think for a digital, for these digital natives, one of the joys here is this multimedia experience of confronting a completely analog medium, like how did a guy with a brush or a pen or a pencil or a crayon make those incredible drawings, and now, I, I, which I can hardly decipher, and now I can see them in glowing color and I can magnify them, explore them, I can do a chic mix, by chopping them up and mixing them up and making my own shicks, I think it's brilliant. And it, what it does is, it what it does is it helps it helps a visitor to focus, it to pay attention to detail, and to sustain attention. And that is a huge, huge achievement in in these kinds of exhibitions. And so here we have other examples, and the you can see where there are there are recurrent themes. And, and it would be very interesting from um, a research point of view to see the evolution of Schick's political thinking, uh, his sensibility with changing events. Because he really begins, uh, I mean, he's born in 1894 in Lodz, and he has his early years before Poland had, get, had regained its independence, before the Second Polish Republic, which was formed in 1918 at the end of the, of the First World War. And so he was actually growing up in a very Polish environment. Lodz was within the most Polish part of the Russian partition. And it was, it, and he was drawing on what was known as the Polish Jewish Brotherhood, a kind of brief, kind of golden period in the 1860s and 70s. And he would associate, he, he would associate, if you will, this so-called fraternity or brotherhood of nations. He would associate it in Poland with this period, but then he would associate it also with Polish-American relations and further. So here, uh, what we have is you can see, he, he's, he's sort of, I would call him, he's creatively anachronistic because he puts together, um, if you will, moments in time that are completely disparate, places that are completely separate, and he finds and he makes the connections. And here, Kosciuszko, remember the Kosciuszko Bridge? Think of Schick. Here it is the glorious days of the Polish-American fraternity because he worked in series, and it is paired with uh, Thomas Jefferson's oath because this, the, basically um, these, are the, uh, uh, these are his way of dealing with the dangers of tyranny, totalitarianism, and human rights, which are in his entire opus but are also, um, also expressed here. Of course, the League of Nations, which was established after World War II, and you can see that one of the things he loves are charters, statutes, uh, declarations, and all of the iconography of heraldry and big capital letters that give these documents their, if you will, their gravitas, their weight, their authority. And he uses that to actually recast 
modern documents of this kind in the visual language of these earlier ones. And then he's done a whole series, basically um, inspired by what's well, called the Heritage of Nations series. It could have been called the United Nations series, including, uh, and this was 1948, including, of course, Israel. But I would say that um, some of the most powerful, I would say, troubling work has to do with evil. And of course, this is uh, an extraordinary work with uh, uh, skulls inside Hitler's eyes and with and you, and all these skulls. And, but what's also interesting is that the victims on the lower left are not rendered in a grotesque or caricature way. They're actually quite realistic. But this is a very, very powerful, very powerful image. And um, he, you can see his identification actually with a certain way of thinking about Polish history because here we've got Poland, the Christ of Nations, which is a, really a dominant paradigm for thinking of Polish history. This is 1939 with um, a, a basically an image that communicates um, a, a Polish perspective on their own history. And of course, I was very, very interested in the way in which he represented uh, the Warsaw, well, basically the Warsaw Ghetto and the Warsaw Ghetto Uprising in two different series, one the Battle of the Warsaw Ghetto and the other the Songs of the Ghetto, one in color, one in black and white, one rather more in his Northern, Northern European mini miniaturist tradition, and the other black and white more in the, uh, I would say, the, the sort of language of comic art. I mean, obviously not comic, but you can see where the decoding of his coded language because there's a way in which he smuggles meaning into every single detail. There's not a detail in these images that is not meaningful. And so here, the Ballad of the Doomed Jews of Europe, this was also very interesting for me because um, I've, uh, uh, one of the w ways in which I encountered Schick's work was at the New York World's Fair, 1939, 1940, because he was actually represented in not where you would expect him to be, but rather in the Polish pavilion. The main Jewish presence at the New York World's Fair was the Jewish Palestine pavilion, and there is no way they would have included Schick's work there. They wouldn't have considered it relevant. But in the Polish pavilion, it was considered very, very relevant indeed, and also um, the, forms of, the forms that protests took in this period were also huge pageants at Madison Square Gardens, incredible pageants. And he pr prepared all kinds of graphic material, including um, images that were in the press to advertise it and call attention to it. And so um, the, 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 uh, this particular image, uh, De Profundis, is a visual meditation on the massacre of Jews during the Second World War. And the motifs are taken from both classical Jewish and Christian texts. And this is a case where, with literary knowledge, with knowledge of these texts, you're, one, one is able to see how those texts are rendered visually, which I think is really, really, really interesting. But one of the, um, um, one of the most astonishing aspects of the political cartoons and caricatures is the way in which Schick subverts if you will, symbols and images of power and makes them into images of humiliation and degradation. And I, I love this particular one, um, Madness, which was a, uh, it was actually a cartoon that appeared on the cover of Collier's. Uh, and these are Nazi leaders, Adolf Hitler, Goering, Himmler, and Goebbels. They stand together pinning Nazi flags on a globe threatened by a Nazi rattlesnake. And at their feet lay the collaborators, uh, 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 Petain, Mussolini, etc. But the quotations are very interesting because it's the, the whole image is about propaganda. And in fact, one of the one of the, there's a way in which Schick is actually commenting on what he's doing, and this one is perhaps the best one. And in this case, this is. Um, th this is a wonderful image, 1939, 1940, 41, 1941, 43, and we will finish the job, taking the swastika and, and, and taking it apart and making it into a cross. That is essentially what he's doing with all of this um, iconography that's associated with power and with totalitarianism. And so these images are all about, if you will, the grotesque, and I was thinking to myself, you know, who, I mean, th this for me is Mad Magazine. 
it's this kind of, a kind of grotesque imagery, uh, imagery that is not only grotesque, but also has an image of, I wouldn't even, well, it's hard to imagine that you could think about it in terms of humor, but there is, it is, um, it's, it's dark humor, it's gallows humor, it's black humor. We're running, we're running short of Jews. With, with Hitler, Himmler, Goering, and Goebbels, 1943. Um, this one is, I, this is the only one I know where he actually, you know, this really does verge on, I wouldn't call it pornographic, but anyway, Benito the Terrific. And, you know, you know uh, uh, ticking off uh, his, his triumphs and giving him a bear behind with, uh, and this is probably closest to uh, Tim of Finland, but I mean, not quite, not quite. But in terms of the, what I thought of as, uh, as, as the sort of verging on the homoerotic, these are the images that I had in mind of the American military. And this would be, this would be another, another example. But also an interesting example because of this feeling of a Polish-American fraternity or brotherhood or alliance. And then finally, of course, um, uh, Schick was very aware of racism in the United States. And this is an extraordinary image. Uh, do not forgive them, O Lord, for they do not know what they do, which is after Luke 23, 34. And he made this image in 1949. He died in the late 50s. And so um, with this collection and with this exhibition, we have a broad sweep of, of Schick's work. And what the exhibition does is to highlight what is actually a through line in his work, which is this commitment to the fight for independence, the struggle for freedom, social justice, human rights, um, and, uh, and protest, active, strong protest against injustice. And my feeling is that it, this material is ripe for analysis, ripe for unpacking, that there are tools from all these various disciplines that can be applied to the material and rewards that can be had from applying those tools to this material. So thank you very much. <laughs> oh, thank you very, very much. It really, this show, the Magnus deserves it, this show deserves it, and you deserve it. Thank you very, very, very much. I feel like I've just had not one semester, but two semesters. <laughs> and uh, instead of saying I only regret I have one life to live, give for this country, it's I, I, that I have, uh, I don't even have one class to offer for this, <laughs> so running this place. Um, so I want to thank you for a phenomenal talk. I want to thank Francesco for a phenomenal exhibition. And, and to thank... <laughs> And to thank Toby for now, uh, to Tad, Toby, Shana Penn, and all involved for uh, making this possible. So uh, among the others who, who have made this possible, uh, Carol Christman and other staff from development and the wonderful staff of the Magnus. Finally, I want to thank you for your support of the Magnus. Uh, the Chancellor is including a joint fundraising effort by the Magnus Jewish Studies and the Institute for Jewish Law and Israel Studies in the major campaign that she will be announcing in honor of leap year at the end of this month. Um, I, we're very lucky to be included in that. And uh, of course, we're highlighting the Magnus here and we hope that you will join in supporting us. Please tell your friends about the Magnus and our exhibitions and don't forget that March 12th opening that I mentioned, the, or celebration. Francesco will be speaking again about, perhaps at greater length, about the exhibit. And uh, we would invite you now to enjoy dessert and enjoy the, uh, the exhibits. Uh, the place closes at 7.30, so we have a bit of time. And our featured guest is here to speak with, so please take advantage of her. Thank you.